from, you'll see more Stetsons than Berets. And when we see a snail, we think, I need to get that out of my garden. Not, let's put butter sauce on that and eat it. But we do have an Eiffel Tower. Beautiful marble landmarks, a winery, and a bakery where you can get croissants, baguettes, and a quiche. I'm from the second largest Paris in the world. We measure distance and time around here. We're two hours northeast of Dallas and 20 minutes from the Oklahoma border. We're the county seat of Lamar County and the Crepe Myrtle capital of Texas. The history of Paris starts in northern Tennessee in 1816 when seven-year-old George Wright left with his family to travel by keelboat west to the unsettled territory. They traveled for six months down the Cumberland, Ohio and Mississippi rivers, then up the Red River. After stopping on the south bank for a rest, a twist of fate helped determine their final destination after their boat and most of their possessions sank in the sandy Red River. In 1839, Wright purchased a thousand acres south and west of his father's land on a ridge of land between the Red River and Sulphur River and opened a store. Lamar County was created on December 17, 1840, and the first county court was held in Wright's store. Two different communities served Lamar County as county seats before Wright donated 50 acres of land in 1844 to establish a county seat that would be centrally located. Descendants of more than one early Lamar County settler claim bragging rights to the naming of Paris. But a line out of a pictorial review of the city of Paris, Texas, that was published in 1885, indicates the credit belongs to Thomas Poteet. Though he's not named in the passage, Thomas Poteet was an employee of Wright's and is one of the names given credit in local lore. Wright's original 50-acre donation is indicated today by Brown Street signs in the downtown area. Corn was the major early crop, changing to cotton when it was discovered to be a more dependable and profitable crop. Steamboats on the Red River shipped crops to New Orleans, and Paris became an important economic center. The influence of the cotton business leaves its mark on Paris today. In 1873, when citizens voted to build a new courthouse, the downtown merchants banded together to have the location moved one block north so farm wagons would be able to park and business would remain downtown. Wright and other early businessmen saw the importance of establishing railroads into Paris and started the process in 1853. This proved to be a critical strategy after the removal of the Great Raft on the Red River drained the river down to a level that made it impossible for steamboats to travel to Lamar County. The Santa Fe and the Frisco Railroads arrived in Paris in 1873, and by 1912, Paris had five railroads. The Santa Fe Depot still stands as a reminder of the past. It has been restored and houses the Lamar County Genealogical Society. Sharing the same parking lot is the Lamar County Historical Museum that is housed in a converted train storage building. But not all of the railroad beds carry trains anymore. The Trail to Paris has almost six miles of paths in the city limits along the old railroad beds, and the trails are part of the Rails to Trails network. <laughs> On the eve of the Civil War, Lamar was the only county to vote unanimously against secession, but readily sent troops in support of the effort when Texas joined the war. One prominent Parisian that served in the war was Sam Bell Maxey, who organized the Lamar Rifles and then the 9th Texas Infantry. Maxey attended West Point, was Stonewall Jackson's roommate, and practiced law with his father, Rice Maxey. Following the Civil War, Maxey served two terms in the U.S. Senate. The Maxey home in Paris was completed in 1868, is now a state park and listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Rice Maxey is thought to be the first burial in Evergreen Cemetery, which was established in 1866 on part of Wright's original 1,000 acres. There are thousands and thousands of graves in Evergreen, including many of the early settlers, but the most famous monument in the cemetery belongs to Willett Babcock. Babcock owned a furniture and cabinet making business, was an undertaker, and owned the Babcock Opera House. He was also the chief of the first fire department in Paris. In true Texas fashion, the monument features Jesus with cowboy boots on. At the beginning of the 20th century, Paris continued to grow and flourish and seemed to have fortune on its side. But that would all change March 21st, 1916, when disaster struck. Around 5 in the evening, a fire started in the southwest area of the city and spread quickly. Gale force winds helped carry burning cinders up to a quarter mile away and fire departments from surrounding communities as far away as Dallas came to try and help. When the fire reached the courthouse, it had been raging for six hours and stopped the courthouse clock at just over an hour till midnight. 
An eyewitness account written by a resident that lived several miles west of Paris provides a chilling vision of what became of Paris. He says when nightfall came, the fire could be seen 20 miles away, and people returning from Paris had such discouraging reports that their stories were taken as exaggeration. But he went to Paris the next morning and describes what he saw. Soon the point was reached where a full view of the wreck and ruin could be had, and behold, Paris was not. There were acres and acres of chimneys, there were miles of tangled streets, there were thousands of smoldering heaps, but not a house in which shelter could be found. Over 1,400 buildings were destroyed. At the time it occurred, based on property damage, it was the worst fire ever in the state of Texas and among the worst in the United States. Paris was almost completely destroyed. But the citizens of Paris immediately organized rebuilding efforts. Businesses set up in tents and other temporary locations, and a model was adopted that reflected the upbeat nature of Paris citizens. Smile! Within a year, most downtown buildings were rebuilt. Now downtown Paris is a time capsule. As you walk around, you see that many buildings bear the date of 1916 or 1917. It is the largest collection of buildings of that time period in one location, and the entire downtown is on the National Historic Registry. Following the fire, Paris resident J.K. Bywater donated his land his house had been built on and money to build a Grecian-style Paris style. Bywater's Park is home to the Paris Municipal Band's summer concerts. The band was formed in 1923 and is the oldest continually performing municipal band in Texas. The band's Friday night concerts draw families with blankets and lawn chairs and always end with a song, I love Paris in the springtime. But the downtown fountain is perhaps the most photographed memorial to the fire. It was built in 1927 by Mr. and Mrs. J.J. Culbertson to commemorate the fire and the regrowth of Paris. The fountain was inspired by a trip to Italy and is built from marble. It is the center point of the downtown square. The Culbertsons also donated money to have a public library built. Constructed in 1931, it was Miss Culbertson's dream to have a library in the city. Just inside the library doors are panels painted by an artist, Jerry Bywaters. Bywaters was born in Paris in 1906 and was the pioneer of an art style known as Texas Regionalism. After becoming an art critic for the Dallas Morning News, he became the director of the Dallas Museum of Art and served in that role for 21 years. In one of the two panels that depict the 1916 fire, you can see the motto, Smile. The stars at night may be big and bright deep in the heart of Texas, but they are studied in West Texas at the McDonald Observatory, named after the Parisian William McDonald. Born in 1844, McDonald established the first national bank which opened for business on the northwest corner of the square in 1886. Under McDonald's shrewd leadership, the bank prospered. McDonald lived a frugal life and when he died in 1926, he left over $850,000 to the University of Texas to establish an astronomical observatory. Back on the square, the Plaza Theater was built in 1926 and now serves as home to the Paris Community Theater. The theater has five productions a year, as well as a children and teen theater program. The building becomes the setting for a haunted theater each year during Pumpkin Fest that takes place on the plaza. But if you are there on a quiet night, you just might hear Annabelle, the real ghost that is said to haunt the theater. Just down the street, Swaim Hardware opened for business in 1932 and has been in the same family for four generations. I'm pretty sure if you look around, you can find something that was on the shelf the day the store opened. Today, Paris is a main street town, and the downtown buildings are filled with antique shops, galleries, unique gift shops, clothing stores, and restaurants. 195 years after the Wrights settled on the south bank of the Red River on soil that would later become Texas, it is easy to forget that Paris owes its start to the flowing red current. As Paris historian and newspaper man A.W. Neville pointed out in 1937, before there were any roads in Texas except the Indian trails, it was the Red River that connected the hardy pioneers to the states they left behind when they turned their faces to the setting sun. I'm just glad the rights didn't pull over on the North Bank instead. <laughs>